Good morning, everyone. It's nice to see all of you. For those of you who don't know us, my name is Kate, Kate Staples. This is Christine Keevan. And we are both teachers here at PIMC. Robert is up in Seattle doing a retreat this weekend. So that gives us an opportunity to hold down these seats. I'm not sure about Christine, but I don't do this very often, so I'm a little bit nervous, so your patience would be lovely and your forbearance. I was sitting here um, noticing the feeling in my body, which is what one does when one's a little emotional. The heart's pounding, the chest is a little tight, but we're going to do this anyway. So, <laughs> um, the way the morning will work is that we will do... Um, Christine's going to do a guided meditation for us for a little while, and then I'll, um, then Jim will do mindful movement. Then I'll talk for a little while, and then Christine will talk for a little while. And I just wanted you to know that we're going to be sure and make room for um, questions and discussion before the end of the morning. Oh, and today's potluck. So hopefully you'll come through this door right here and join us for potluck. Whether or not you brought anything, it really doesn't matter. We'll, we always have enough. I think we're good. Oh, is there anyone here who's here for the first time? Oh, lovely. Well, no, this is not quite our normal morning. I, th I hope you enjoy it. I hope it's good for you. So, good morning. I wanted to do a loving kindness meditation with you all this morning. And uh, loving kindness is a concentration practice. So it's not hugely different from what we usually do here on Sunday mornings. But I'm going to guide you through it. So, um, so just sit back and enjoy. So we start by finding a comfortable sitting posture. Closing your eyes if you feel comfortable with that. And bring your attention inward. Notice the contact between your body and what you're sitting on. It could be the chair, the cushion, or the ground. Notice the support provided by that sitting object. You might notice in your body if there are areas of tightness or holding. Areas which are calm and relaxed. Maybe you might notice some heat or some cold. You can notice that this body is pretty alive with sensations. And for the next few moments, just notice how the breath breathes you. How you don't have to do anything at all to have this breath coming and going. It just naturally takes care of you. You might notice where it is in your body that you notice the breath. It might be the belly or the chest 
or the nostrils of the nose. We can train the mind to bring attention to these places and really deeply examine what this in-breath is like and what this out-breath is like. Each one is different from the other. And right now, there's nothing else to do. Just notice the breath coming and going. It's the same breath of all living beings. We can feel our connection to the earth and all living beings through this breath. And now maybe shift your attention to the area that we call the heart. And just notice how the heart is this morning. How the heart feels toward yourself, toward others. We can cultivate an accepting attitude toward the heart at this moment. It doesn't have to be anything other than it is. We can practice with the heart by doing this practice that we call loving kindness. And I'm going to lead you in saying some phrases to yourself that acknowledge your true loving nature. You might not feel this loving nature in the moment, but it is there beneath all the layers of worry, pain, restlessness, desire. And with each of these phrases, as I say them, maybe repeat them to yourself. Feel them as much as you can. Just be present with these phrases as I share them with you. May I love and accept myself exactly as I am in this moment. May I be free of fear and worry. May I know the complete safety of an undefended heart. May I be peaceful and at ease. May I love and accept myself exactly as I am in this moment. May I be free of fear and worry. May I know the complete safety 
of an undefended heart. May I be peaceful and at ease. Focus on the phrases and the feeling that is generated inside when you say the phrase to yourself. And remember that there's no right way to feel. And when the mind wanders, wanders, gently bring it back to the next phrase that you remember. May I love and accept myself exactly as I am in this moment. May I be free of fear and worry. May I know the complete safety of an undefended heart. May I be peaceful and at ease. May I love and accept myself exactly as I am in this moment. May I be free of fear and worry. May I know the complete safety of an undefended heart. May I be peaceful and at ease. Now that we have wished ourselves well, Let's see if we can expand the heart further to include a few others. Bring to mind someone who has cared for you or shown kindness to you. Could be a mentor, a friend, a teacher, or a pet. Picture this being as you wish him or her well. May you, dear friend, love and accept yourself exactly as you are in this moment. May you be free of fear and worry. May you know the complete safety of an undefended heart. May you be peaceful and at ease. Notice the feeling that is generated when you wish this being well. Accept whatever comes. May you love and accept yourself exactly as you are in this moment.
May you be free of fear and worry. May you know the complete safety of an undefended heart. May you be peaceful and at ease. Open your heart as wide as you can to give to this person. May you love and accept yourself exactly as you are in this moment. May you be free of fear and worry. May you know the complete safety of an undefended heart. May you be peaceful and at ease. Now let's expand the circle even wider to include everyone in this room and all of those in the surrounding neighborhood. May you love and accept yourself exactly as you are in this moment. May you be free of fear and worry. May you know the complete safety of an undefended heart. May you be peaceful and at ease. When others do well, we do too, as we are all connected. Ultimately, there is just the one. Wishing others well helps us expand our notion of the separate, independent self that has to compete for resources and its survival. Wishing others well helps us relinquish this small, separate self. May you, in the surrounding Sangha neighborhood, city. Love and accept yourself exactly as you are in this moment. May you be free of fear and worry. May you know the complete safety of an undefended heart.
May you be peaceful and at ease. Notice how it is to wish these beings well. And we can extend our kind wishes to include all beings everywhere on this planet. And maybe on other unknown planets as well. May all beings love and accept themselves exactly as they are in this moment. May all beings be free of fear and worry. May all beings know the complete safety of an undefended heart. May all beings be peaceful and at ease. May all beings love and accept themselves exactly as they are in this moment. May all beings be free and fear of fear and worry. May all beings know the complete safety of an undefended heart. May all beings be peaceful and at ease. And we send out our well wishes, hoping that everyone realizes their true, great nature. If all beings recognize their true nature, there would be an end to pain and suffering. May all beings love and accept themselves exactly as they are in this moment. May all beings be free of fear and worry. May all beings know the complete safety of an undefended heart. May all beings be peaceful and at ease. Notice the feeling that's generated in the heart, the 
mind. Allow yourselves to just be present with what is right now. And thank yourselves for taking the time and effort for this practice. May all beings be free of suffering. Thank you so much for your attention, and uh, we're going to turn turn things over to Jim, and he's going to do some mindful movement with you. Okay, we'll get in touch with our feet on the floor and our connection with the earth through the feet, through the floor, into the foundation and into the earth. <coughs> so we'll begin as we usually do with just noticing how the weight shifts from one foot to the other and as we shift the center of gravity the the body responds. There's a whole series of different sensations on the side that has the weight and the other side releases, relaxes. Somehow the body knows how far to go without taking any risks. Then we move around in a circle, give a little puzzle to the center uh, to the uh, sense of balance and the center of gravity moves in a circle the body knows how to respond to that and we know that everything's okay because there's just the right amount of engagement and not any sense of tension or fear or risk taking or holding it's just playful so as we sink into our knees, we can feel the power of the legs lifting us up and then the control of sinking slowly, the control lifting up. We have a choice as to how we move into our knees and back up to a neutral position. The quality of our movement is under our control, but the overall organization is somebody else altogether. Okay, let's let the arms rise. As we sink, we relax the arms. Again, we 
control the quality of the movement by just listening to the body. What feels good? We've been sitting still. Now we put a little round, open movement to the joints in the body, and there's a pleasant feeling that emerges. We lift and open to the side, and that pleasant feeling spreads throughout the rib cage. So we practice with the four foundations of mindfulness. We remember the sequence of moves, think about what's next and what's coming. Well, you don't have to, I do. <laughs> and then <coughs> set the body in motion and then the feelings change. Just openness and embracing the world. What happens in the body changes how we feel about our experience. Let's go overhead, paint a rainbow. Now we have an image in the mind. And the image changes the feelings as the sensations flow from one side to the other. They're colorful images. And then relaxing, crossing the wrists, coming up the center and separating clouds. That's another relaxing image. We're not overextending our Sensations were just gently opening. Nice round movements that opens up all the joints in the shoulders and the elbows, the wrists. And then moving one hip back, turning to the side, palms up, push with one hand, pull with the other. Again, the body takes over the coordination. We just sort of suggest a swimming kind of motion, moving through the energy around us, noticing how same gestures are being made all around us. And that harmony of movement creates a harmony of feeling. Dropping the arms, we open the shoulders all the way around as long as that's not painful or harmful to your body. Just work it through as best you can. Notice the breath change. And then Lifting across, the heel comes off the floor and one foot gets very engaged. And we don't tip over. The floor tells us that we're shifting all the weight into one leg. So the, the song of the floorboards tells us where the weight is. Then turn and gaze at the moon. And again, the sound starts harmonizing.
reaching for the corner. And then my favorite gesture is the cloud hands. One hand looking at us, one hand looking at the earth. No grasping, no contraction, just openness. Open fingers, open palm, open shoulders. And again, the gesture creates a feeling. And we know the feeling's there because of the sensations. Feeling relaxed and knowing it. And then we're going to jazz things up a bit. Step forward and splash in the sea. <coughs> Different feeling. Riding the waves. Opening the arms. And back to the center. We'll step out to the other side and splash in the sea. Ride the waves. And open the arms. Back to the center. And then just feel that stillness and connection with the earth and balance between the two legs, the two feet. They're engaged symmetrically. And the feelings, the sensations tell us that there is a center to this standing form and it's still. There's a quality of breath, a quality of feelings that goes together with that centeredness. Then we sink, make a fist, and let the dragon rise from the sea. And again, the feelings change with the gesture. And then up on the toes, we spread our wings and fly with the cranes. And then turning a big wheel, everything gets into the gesture, from the toes to the fingertips above. <clears throat> and we'll go the other way. Back to the center. 
Again, feeling that balance, stillness, and then establishing one foot as stable and the other foot moving and switching. So the body somehow knows how to do both things, hold stable and flow. And then coming back to the center, we'll just breathe easy. The flow slows down. And there's the sound of your breath, the sound of people around you breathing. Once more. Relaxing the arms, sinking a little bit into the knees, pulling shoulders down and back. What are the effects of all this movement? Pleasant sensations. Perhaps there's still contractions and tightness and some chronic holding that you carry with you all the time, but maybe that's a little softer than usual. Standing and knowing it. Aware of a river of sensations and knowing that we know this river. This is our home base. This is the flow of energy that supports our life 24-7. Feeling gratitude, connection, affection, warmth towards this river of sensation. And then once more, opening and releasing, using rhythm to influence the feelings. Thank you very much. Good morning, Sangha. You know that Robert is away this weekend, and so, you know, like any good guiding teacher, he always wants to make sure when he's away that we're eating all of our dinner and we're doing all of our homework and we're not watching too much TV and we're getting to bed on time. So let's all say hi to Robert. Robert, we're, we're being good, really. not having wild parties either. <laughs> so in case you don't know who I am, I am your friendly neighborhood uh, community coordinator. My name is Avi, and I have a few announcements. Um, the uh, Basics of Mindfulness class started uh, on Thursday night. This was the first night, if you've been on the fence about doing the uh, twice a year Basics of Mindfulness class, you probably still have time to get in on it. Uh, please save the date for the 14th of April. Uh, there's going to be an all-day retreat with Robert and Doug. They're doing a retreat called What Are Love and Compassion Really? 
Then also on the evening of the 14th, Jennifer Berezan, who is Robert's, one of Robert's favorite spiritual musicians, is going to be doing a concert at Unity Church of Portland. I'm sure that you can find information on the web. On April 21st, Jim is going to be doing another one of his half-day Qigong retreats. If you really liked what he was doing now for just a few minutes, think of how great you'll feel doing it for four hours. And information on that is on the website. Uh, coming soon to the website on April 28th, we're doing a volunteer day to get some stuff done and to have some community and some pizza. So um, that will be on the website later this week and just penciled in on your calendar. And uh, kind of looking far ahead as you plan your summer, on uh, Sunday, June 3rd, is the Portland Buddhist Festival in the park. And it, goes on, it, it overlaps with us. It goes from 11 in the morning to 4.30 at night. But it seems like it's an excellent opportunity for us to connect with the larger Buddhist community in Portland. Um, I'd like to see about having a table there, if there is anybody who is interested in helping staff a table, so that we can let the larger Buddhist community and people who are interested know what we're doing. Please come and see me, or email me, or, or talk to me, or call me. For today, uh, Dharma Consults. Jim is doing Dharma Consults. If you have an existing practice and issues are coming up, please see Jim. If you've always wanted to start a practice, please see Jim. The sign-up sheets are there by the double doors. They start at 12, 10, 20, 20 minutes a shot for three of them. Um, and we do Dharma, con we arrange Dharma consults other times, but this is like the, uh, the easiest time during the week. So if you have a burning need, take advantage of it. Today is our potluck day. So if you've got potlucks, stuff in your cars, probably um, going out to your cars like really soon after the Dharma talk ends to get into the kitchen would be a good idea. Please join us for potluck food and drinks and good conversation with fellow Sangha members. Um, if you wish to engage with this community at a deeper level, uh, there's always an opportunity to volunteer here, which is, as Robert keeps reminding us, is not about getting work done. It is about connecting with people where work is the excuse. So if you have an interest in doing that, is Kirsten here today? Kirsten, are you here? Kirsten is our volunteer coordinator. Um, her information is on the website. Uh, you can contact her or me, and we can connect you with volunteerism here so that you can get more deeply connected with this community. Going along the same lines, not only do we use volunteer energy, but we use money in order to keep this place going and pay the bills. The uh, Roberts, decades old Donna Bull is there in the back. Please drop uh, a little something in there to help keep this place going and give another form of energy to perpetuate this thing that really is very helpful to an awful lot of people. There are six, sit there are <laughs> six sits every good blood, bad blood, red leather, yellow leather. When I, when, I was, when, I was, when I was like six, I had a lisp, and that was one of the things that the, that the uh, speech pathologist told me to say. So, six, there are six, 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 six sits every week. <laughs> this is the big one, but if you like something a bit more intimate, then we've got those two. Information is on the website. We also have spiritual friends groups, which are affiliated groups that meet privately in homes where people can work on the Dharma, meditate together, do, do readings together on their own schedule apart from what we do here at PMC, PIMC. Uh, information is on the website. If you would either like to join one or start one, please contact me and let me know. We also have um, our, our uh, Transitions Project donations. That's what that trunk is for over there if you have things that you don't need that are in pretty good condition. Donating those things can really help uh, people who are currently homeless get back on track with their lives. Um, and, those, and Michael brings those down to the Transitions Project on a regular basis. And then um, for questions about anything having to do with PIMC, my office hours are Monday through Thursday in the mornings here at PIMC. Please call me, email me, stop by and say hi, and I will do anything I can to help you connect with this community in terms of teachings or uh, Dharma consults or spiritual instruction or whatever it is that you need that this community can provide. One final thing, there's been some bubbling up of interest in having a monthly Buddhist movie night, 
which I think is a really cool idea because there are lots of mindfulness movies and documentaries out there and it would just be really swell to have at least once a month we, we get together and who knows, maybe there's popcorn. But we, 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 get to, we get to see movies, we get to see movies about, about mindfulness and about what's going on in the rest of the world of mindfulness and Buddhism. Um, I know that there are a couple of people who are interested. If that is something that would, would be of interest to you, we've got, I, we could probably use one or two more people to help arrange that. So either contact me or see me afterwards. Um, I think that's it. So I hope you all stay dry and that you all have a blessed day, except I see a hand raised. But, well, why, why don't you say it and then I'll repeat it because they won't be able to hear it without the microphone. All right, so, so the book group the, is starting again this Monday, and it meets here Monday evenings? Monday evenings, and we're starting a book by Jamie Pollock called Living the Examined Life. It's a really easy Okay, book. all right, well, hold on. So it's James Holland. It, the book is Living the, Life. Living the Examined Life by James Hollis. And, and, and can I ask a question? How, how long will you accept people in the group, you know? All right, that meets here at PIMC on Monday nights. It's starting this Monday, and it goes seven, starts at seven. 7.30. Starts at 7.30. There's information in the KM group listing under community on the website. All right, if, that, if there is nothing else, have a blessed day, one and all. really are such a well-mannered group. <laughs> well, the meta and the movement have made me much more comfortable. Kind of works that way. So, Christine and I, last week, did a retreat, a women's retreat. And the things we prepared and the things we learned really led us to the realization that this topic really applies to everything and everyone. So today we're going to be talking about some gender issues and our relationship to those and how we use the Dharma to become more mindful about our own issues and how we treat others. And I don't know if you've ever noticed, it's pretty impossible to change the other guy. It just doesn't work. So what we can do is we can become intimately familiar with our own um, responses and conditions about a subject that permeates everything we do. It's, it is so foundational. How we identify our own gender, it profoundly affects every reaction we have. Since I know some of you are new to PMC, I wanted to take just a couple minutes to go over the eight pieces of the Eightfold Path, just because it's so foundational and it's so important that we can't become too familiar with it. This is the set of tools or ideas that the Buddha gave us to help us um, work through things. So the first one is right or perfect view, wise view. When we say right in, um, under these circumstances, it means like integrated. It's a fully fleshed out and understood view. So often when people come here for the first time, it's like, well, that makes sense. You hear something and it's like it, it lands, you know it's true. Uh, for example, all things are temporary. You might not have thought about it much, but it is true. And when you think about it, 
You just know it. You can just feel it. There's no question about it. Um, and then there is wise aspiration. And that means I see what's true, and I, want, I intend to do the right thing. I intend to do the wise thing. There is perfected or whole speech. I had a lovely interaction with a young man who identified as trans for me in a personal discussion the other day, offering me his wisdom on how I can use speech more kindly, um, more effectively, more knowledgeably to address gender issues. And he very kindly has offered to kind of coach me because I think a lot of us are just a little uncertain about how to go about right speech when it comes to gender these days. I know my intention is to be respectful and kind and thoughtful, but sometimes we need help in doing that. But that's, that's an example of right speech. That's how we can use right speech to be open and um, kind with one another. Proper livelihood. I'm not sure that comes into gender a lot. I, I guess it could in some cases. Uh, full effort, energy, or vitality. Obviously, we have to want to bring some issue. We want to have to bring some energy to the issue of understanding ourselves and others around gender issues. So that's important. And um, complete or thorough awareness is important because without bringing mindfulness to the whole issue, it, we have many, many unconscious reactions. They're really really conditioned, especially when it comes to gender and sexuality. Our responses are very automatic. So bringing mindfulness um, to the practice really helps. And um, the last is full integrated samadhi. It's like in um, concentration. So we really want to focus. It might be good to decide that for a period of time we're going to bring our attention, our focus, to this, this issue and have it come to the top as a priority. It's just a thought. We, as we practice, we turn our attention to different ways that we can improve our lives and be happier. And I don't know of anything that causes, that has the potential for causing more suffering than our own relationship to our sexuality, our gender. So I just, that, so that's the Eightfold Path. And I just wanted to like, give it a quick review for those of you who might not be familiar with how important it is to this practice. Then, I want to talk for a couple minutes about how we develop our ideas and our, um, where we are right now in terms of our own uh, gender identification, how we feel about characteristics. First off, I think it's really important to acknowledge that we are biological beings. We come into this moment in time and we don't grow out of being lizard-brained. That comes with. So the hormones, the um, physical and chemical responses in our bodies, those are not something that we can do anything about. We can supplement them, we can change them if that's our intention but they have an effect on us. It's not like something that's out there that we can't touch. It is a part of our physiology. And it comes, we come equipped with those things at birth. And so that part is pretty well, well nailed down, although there's a lot more range than most of us know when we're born. It's not just a matter of XY chromosomes and that's it. There's a lot more variables in there. So we have our physical person, and then we have, of course, our experiences as we grow up, and we have profoundly cultural influences on how we should behave. An example from my life is, my mother was um, widowed when I was a very small child, and she had to take care of three little girls by herself. And she was one determined woman, and she was absolutely committed to doing a good job. But her way of doing that was, I was taught that no one should ever ask for or accept help 
and that women could do anything a man could do and should. Now the consequences of that conditioning for me were that I thought I had to do everything by myself or I was failing. And what that tended for, toward for me was being very contracted. I was very closed off. And when I, when I realized that I could open myself to um, needing help or um, really understanding that other people had wisdom and kindness to offer me that it was not only acceptable to want, it was, uh, it, hel it helped me grow as a person. And consequently, I've been a lot happier because I feel much more connected to people now, now that I don't feel like I have to do it all myself. So we all have these conditions that happen as we're growing up. We have the biological, we have the psychological, we have the cultural, and we have all those things that happen to us. Some of them are good, some of them are bad, some of us end up on one end of the spectrum in terms of femininity or masculinity or uh, gender, gender neutral. And what makes the difference is not where we land, it's our relationship to how we feel about where we land. So what I'm suggesting is that through mindfulness, we take the time to start noticing our triggers, noticing when we have a reaction to something that comes up. And I think there's a practice called Vedana, which I find very, very useful. It's um, the practice of noticing your reaction to things. Do, when a feeling comes up, do I like this? Do I not like this? Am I drawn toward it? Am I pushed away? Do, do I want to stay away from it? Or am I neutral? And by this very simple practice, we start to notice how um, automatic our reactions are. And by noticing how automatic our reactions are, we can begin to have agency over those reactions. We can begin to take a small amount of control. This is where the idea of karma vipaka comes in. Karma is an action that I take that's intentional. Vipaka is the results of that action. Now, I don't know if that goes on into another life. It doesn't affect me a lot. What I know is that if I do an intentional action right now, I am planting the seeds of whatever happens in the next moment. So when I start to notice my automatic responses to things, I can then start taking the time to modify my reactions. So things that tend to come up that are so powerfully overwhelming, things like jealousy, things like the fear of loss, or um, fear of our own worth as people, all of that's so tied to gender. And so to begin to really um, When you meditate, you open your consciousness for things that you don't already know. It's like laying the groundwork, waiting for things to arise that um, are new information that's in, your con that's in the consciousness. And it's a gift when you quiet your mind, it carries over into the other parts of your life so that... Um, you will find you'll notice, and not necessarily trying to change, but notice anger arising. Maybe somebody has said something that's triggering you. And instead of just reacting without thought, you prepare the way, you train to react with kindness and wisdom and thoughtful intention so that there's uh, calm and ease behind your responses, and you spread the seeds of love and kindness instead of the reactivity of um, this tyranny of the uh, unacknowledged conditions that we all live with. And it really is tyranny. It's like if you don't take the time to do the work 
to examine what it is in your life that's causing you to act in certain ways, then you don't have um, the tiny little bit of control that we get to have when we're really mindful of how we lead our lives. And obviously, it's going to lead us to be uh, more kind and thoughtful to other people. One of the things that the Buddha advised is that we not only look at our own uh, actions and conditions and our own perceptions. My mind responds to an object and then I have a lot of ideas about what happened. That's true of everybody. Everybody does that. And so it's really, really important to uh, the growth of empathy and to acknowledge that what arises in me arises in others. And it's also really good for your self-forgiveness because we all have these human bodies. We all have these conditions. We all have uh, uh, this unique personality that is formed of all our different ideas about things, all our different ideas about ourselves. So that's really a very humanizing uh, sort of practice to have. Uh, the, just a word about how we deal with these things. I think the Dharma and our practice is a wonderful, wonderful approach to gender issues. I also think that there are a lot of, there's a lot of conditioning. All, all of us go through uh, childhood trauma and trauma at different times in our adult life. And so I just want to put in a word for uh, the, the value of getting a good therapist and some, someone to help you along the way when you find that something's just dug in there too deep and you really need a hand to hold while you work through things. And often when you, um, when you meditate, when you do this practice, stuff is going to come up. I mean, that's what you want to have open. So my, um, my experience is that you respect the boundaries that you have in place because they're there to protect you and we let them go a little bit at a time. And as we do, we might really need some good help, good friends, um, a, the help of a therapist to help us work through these things. Uh, and I think, I think it adds value. I think it's really worth doing. I think, I think that's about all I have to say. We are going to, like I said before, we're going to have time to take questions and to have some discussion. Um, but I'm going to turn it over to Christine for a little while. Okay. We have the strange experience of being ahead of schedule. <laughs> <laughs> we'll have That's so weird. Time <laughs> Absolutely. So, yeah, as Kate was talking about, you know, we have this gender identity. We have this part of the self, right? And I'm going to talk a little bit later about, you know, what the Buddha said about self. And of course, we have these ways that we identify, maybe as a father or a mother or a teacher or a student or a male or a female or gender neutral. All these, all these different things are, are ways that we, sort of like ways that we label ourselves. And Right now especially, I don't know if all of you have noticed, but there's so much that's out there in the media, in the conversations that people are having that are, is really stimulating around this topic. Um, so when I was thinking about this, I thought, well, what advice does the Buddha have about this? You know, what, you know, how can I, how can I turn to my practice in some ways to be there for me when there are all these triggers everywhere and things that come up and thoughts that show up and emotions that show up. Well, the Buddha talked about, as Kate was saying, one of the things that he talked about was impermanence. And everything is changing all of the time. So you guys might have noticed as you've been sitting here, you know, your body is changing. You have to move all the time. You have your, um, there's been different thoughts probably that have come up since you've been here. 
the configuration of the room has changed. It's like there's this field that's always changing. Kate brought up how um, she felt much more calm after Jim did the movement. I noticed that too. It's like there's something that happens in this room, the connection between the people that are here and us and all of us sitting here that changes the field, right? And Kate also mentioned the thing about cause, law of ca cause and effect and karma. And what this tells us is that while we don't have absolute control over what can happen, of course, the self does think that we are in control. You know, it kind of comes up with a number of ways of thinking that um, we can orchestrate things or uh, do things in a particular way and we'll have a particular outcome. While we're not in total control, we do have some influence over how things, what things show up because we're, we're a part of everything. So there's a way that we have this influence and the question is, what kind of influence do we actually want to have? And I think that's an important question for people because um, it's important to think about that before we actually go out in the world and do things. And what kind of an influence do we want to have on ourselves first and then on other people? And as Kate was talking about, our talks overlap a little bit, um, as she was talking about the Eightfold Path and the Five Precepts, they give some guidelines about this, about skillful living as a means of living with ourselves and in relationship to other people. So one piece of this, as Kate was mentioning, is awareness and respect for our own conditioning. And she talked about all the different ways that conditioning can show up in our lives. And this includes the thoughts that we have, the emotions that we have, attitudes, opinions, personal stories. I don't know whether you've thought about it much, but these are all conditioned, which is such a strange thing to think sometimes. I know there's, every once in a while, I'll have a thought come up that says, oh, you can't do that, or you're this or you're that. And generally, we don't notice it, right? But with mindfulness, we can notice it. And we can say, huh, is that really true? Or where did that come from? And that sounds like some kind of a story that's, that's there. So we can recognize these stories. And even our bodily body sensations, those are conditioned as well. Um, there's a way that when we're fearful, you might notice that there's a lot of contraction in here. Or when we're angry, sometimes our fists will, you know, our hands will kind of ball up in fists or we feel a lot of heat in our body. I noticed the other day after doing a yoga class, this was kind of crazy, but um, we worked a lot in the yoga class on hip flexors, which are right here. And um, I don't know, I hadn't noticed too much my relationship to my hip flexors. I don't know about you guys, but I, except for the fact that I sit a lot for my job. And so I notice when I stand up, these are really tight. Um, so we worked a lot on those in the class. And then as I'm driving over here last weekend, I noticed oh, wow, you know, my, my legs, they just feel so, you know, really calm, and, and you just I, I felt really good. And I had some thought about something. It was an anxiety thought. It was a thought about, oh, I have to do this, and I have to get this done. And I noticed immediately the hip flexors tightened. That was kind of crazy. They tightened as a result of a thought. Whoa. <laughs> And this tightened. I mean, I could imagine, okay, a thought and maybe my brow furrows. I, I kind of thought about those two going together, or maybe my heartbeat quickened. But this was something that I thought was completely unrelated. So there's this way that our body sensations, those also carry a story. They carry a very deep story for us. So being mindful and aware of that can be important. And once we know these particular pieces, we can decide 
what is skillful and wholesome, one of the things that the Buddha taught with the Eightfold Path is recognizing when thoughts, emotions, our relationship to ourself is loving, kind, compassionate, generous, and when it has that other thing, which is kind of more filled with greed and aversion. And we can notice that, and we can, kind of, we can feed the one that's more kind and generous. In my example with the hip flexors, I, was, I noticed that, and I thought, oh, I don't really want those to tighten up. And I, there, was, there was a moment of just sort of saying, okay, thanks for sharing thought, move on. <laughs> Because I, 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 I wanted more of that openness and more of that um, nurturing of the body rather than the um, conflictual relationship with the body. And when we find parts that are not as, um, you know, that are more destructive or more, um, you know, more along the lines of greed and aversion... We can choose um, not to feed that. So we can choose to feed what's, what's wholesome and skillful and not to feed the other. And oftentimes we can also get, I think, um, pretty angry at ourselves for, for, for what we feel. Um, so I think that's important to note, too, that there are ways in which when we're just using mindfulness to notice things, we might notice thoughts or we might notice emotions and there's a way that we don't do ourselves a service when we notice those and we end up judging them sometimes we can't help it the mind just does that it says stuff like oh that's not very buddhist of you or you really should be more peaceful or something like that it kind of kind of gets at you and to notice that that's just a part of ourselves that's just an end We laughed here, and that was great because that's being playful with it. It's like, oh, yeah, there's that part, too. There's that part that says I should be more this or more that. We can notice when greed and hatred arise. And one thing I think is important is working with greed and hatred as they show up um, on ourselves before we actually start to approach it with other people. It's really important to find a way to regulate ourselves when we get that email or we get that Facebook message or we're, you know, we're reading the news. I've actually stopped looking at my phone in the morning because I've discovered I get this thing called a morning briefing. Have you guys gotten that? (laughs) Jeez. And, and it has listed out, this is, what hap- this is what's going on already today in the morning before you know, I get up at 6. So it's like, geez, <laughs> uh, the world's busy. But anyway, it, it might end up that, you know, that this, this ends, we have to turn that off or just not, just not look at that. We have to find ways to regulate ourselves before taking action. We can have a tendency to get fired up and... Um, you know, act in ways that that don't actually um, don't actually bring what we're hoping they're going to bring. They might not. It might not bring peace and understanding, or and it doesn't have to bring agreement. It's more just like helping each other understand. We can have very big reactions when our stories fit what's happening out there when we have a story that's inside one big clue that um, that we have an internal story is that the reaction we have to something is really big usually if our reaction isn't big it's like okay it's the event we can kind of put it into a context but when it fits with something that's been in our past or as part of our story, that's a way that we can end up um, having a very big reaction to it. And that's a moment to really just slow down and pay attention to what that reaction is. And we need to be kind and gentle with that. 
kind and gentle with ourselves when we end up having anger, resentment come up, sadness or shame. Because emotions are just indicators. They're indicators that something's going on inside, something very important's going on inside. We need to pay attention to that. When we can invite it in and explore it, that's when we can really make use of it. And I want to say something about, about anger. And um, anger is an interesting emotion. It, um, it seems very motivating. And in a certain way, it is motivating. Um, when we get angry, we tend, that's the moment that we tend to take action. But I think when we get angry, those are the moments when we need to say, oh, this is a time to really get motivated to start understanding more about what that anger is actually about deep down inside. Because usually with anger, there's something else underneath. There's hurt. There's sadness. There's needs that haven't been met. And if we don't actually get to that part, then when we end up expressing what we want to to other people, we may end up expressing this anger, but we never get to what's deep down inside. I remember there was an episode that my husband and I had where he probably won't mind if I tell you guys about this, but there was a, there was a, a toaster that appeared in our household, and um, we already had a toaster. And so all of a sudden I see this toaster, and anger just showed up out of nowhere, just rage. It was like, oh, my God, there's the, because I knew what this toaster was. This toaster was... Um, it it, it 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 represented. It was red. <laughs> Still remember it. Yep. And it was really hard to get to. I was like, why am I so mad about this thing? But I was mad because um, it actually ended up being a toaster that he wanted for his son, who was more gluten free than I was. Um, and but there, I didn't have any part in saying whether there was going to be a toaster or not. It was just there. It was. And so I, I just was like, well, what's this thing doing here? And da da da, and getting, getting angrier and angrier. And I think he was just like, whoa, what's, what's happening here? And as we unraveled it, we discovered that the real piece that was in there was I was afraid. I was really afraid of not having some say or some something or other about the things that showed up in our house. Was I going to end up just with whatever? Um, you know, who, toaster today, who knows what it is, motorcycle tomorrow, I don't know. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I, I, it, was, um, it was, it was, but to, but to get to that anger, to get to that place where I could understand a little bit more what that was about. And I don't think that us getting to a place where we understand that part, or maybe have some equanimity about the anger that we do feel, that, isn't necess that doesn't necessarily mean we're not going to be motivated in life. That doesn't mean that we're not going to be able to say the things that need to be said or that we're going to end up just being... I think there's a misunderstanding in, in, um, in Buddhism that, well, we're just working on reactions so that we can quiet the mind and quiet ourselves, and then we'll all be at, we'll, we'll be at peace, and the rest of the world will be like crazy, Right? It's not, it's not about that. I mean, it really is about um, coming to that place where we can find that sense of equanimity inside so that we can skillfully respond. Because we do need each other to heal. That's a very important piece. We need community to heal. The way that, the way that trauma happens is in community. It's like we need that community. We can't, we can't do things ourselves. So it's not just a matter of feeling a little better inside, and then that's the end of story. And I wanted to say um, a little bit about, um, def define for you guys the, um, the relative, just the relative level versus the absolute level. And you'll have to bear with me, because I've actually never tried to describe this to a big group of people. So I was thinking, oh gosh, how am I going to do this? But I think this is important because relative level is what we've been talking about so far. It's this thing with 
what, at what all appears out here in the world. There appear to be these separate beings. There appear to be, you know, this table, this cup, and Kate sitting next to me. Um, and while I, I say appear, it's, it's like, yes, she's, we can't deny the existence of all these forms that are out here. And there's a way that emotions, thoughts, the self, all of that is the personality. All of that is, um, that's what's happening on a relative level. Our interactions with each other are happening at a relative level, mostly. Um, so everything that we're doing out there in the world, or so much of it, most people are doing it at this, at this relative level, this interactional level, this level of form. There is an absolute level which can actually help us a lot if we practice enough that we can feel into the absolute level. And what the absolute level is, is that we're all everything. That there really is no, that the, the, the personalities that we have, the differences in personalities, that the differences we have in gender, differences that we have in so many ways, in the absolute realm, these, these aren't there. In the absolute level, there are no distinctions because the mind is what makes all the distinctions. The mind is what carries forward the ideas about this is this, this is that. At an absolute level, that's, that's not there. And at, a, at an absolute level, all there is is this this presence, which is a very loving presence. It's what people call your Buddha nature or your um, the, the real just inherent loving nature that is part of all of us. And I think this can be helpful because we can remember this part as a, as a, it's like both of these are going on at the same time, the relative and the absolute, those are going on at the same time. And if we can hold both of them, there's a way that we can remember what is, you know, when we're all caught up in an emotion or all caught up in a thought, to be able to remember that absolute level that really it's all okay. I'm not the separate being. I'm not this, I don't have to think, I, I don't have to be completely in control of things. It could be okay to let go a little bit. And with other people, to know that everybody that you come into contact with, they are all similar in this way. It's like they are all part of this universal whole, this whole that does not have those distinctions. And that can be so helpful when we, when we think that somebody has these ideas that are really threatening and just hard to be with we can remind ourselves about this, this other piece. So I think, um, I think I'm going to stop here. It's about 11.30, so we thought that maybe we could have a discussion, um, have people ask questions or give comments or, yeah, just... Okay. I'll take this back first, and then. If each of you, after you speak, you could just hold on to the microphone, and then we'll give it to the next person. Hi, Bernie. How are you doing? Good. My, um, I just had thoughts um, from your weekend uh, retreat. Um, did you guys um, go further into uh, the Me Too movement, discussing how gender, um, although it could be the, um, a good framework to talk about abuse and power differential in our society, um, that it should not stop there. That framework could actually imprison the evolution of that movement. Uh, Barney, we actually made a conscious decision to, we, we only had four hours together, and this is a huge issue. 
So it was felt that we, could, we needed to establish a, a safe and comforting group to begin with, to start um, preparing a platform that might be more suitable to focus on the Me Too issues. Um, and that it would, because it's so important and so profoundly emotional when it comes up, we knew that it would take the entire space if we went there. Yep. So we decided to, to um, get to know one another a little bit in the setting and then with the possibility of having that be the focus of another meeting or retreat at some time. Yeah, my experience um, with um, abuse and um, issues like this is there's usually a uh, lack of boundary issue behind it. And then if you peel it further back another layer, there's a lack of differentiation or self-differentiation behind the lack of boundary. And that self-differentiation, the lack of it comes from uh, obtaining a sense of self from a reflected self, seeing, getting approval from someone else. And our first contact with our parents, uh, uh, we derive our sense of self through that reflected self, getting approval or getting the okays from them. So um, I think um, tying in gender uh, or cementing gender as the label behind the abuse will not take us that far. I, uh, that is why even uh, men are abused, even boys are abused, and it's because of that breakdown of boundaries or the lack of development of boundaries that goes all the way back to self-differentiation and it goes all the way back to our early imprints of how we derive our sense of self. And it's through that reflected self. Absolutely. So and if we just stay with the Me Too movement as a gender-based movement, it might not take us that far. It is, um, it is one door that we can use, that we can walk through to help us identify gender-based issues that cross the genders. We're not in this alone. We're not in this alone as women or as men. We are all in this stew together. And so bringing mindfulness to how it affects all of us, I agree that that's really important. Um, Christine, we're going to share this. Yeah, yeah. So when you yeah. want it, yeah. please, please grab. We'll do that. Yeah. yeah. I know there are more questions out there. Could you say your name, please? My name is Charles. Charles. I just wanted to thank you for bringing up the absolute part of life. Um, it seems like any sittings I go to or Dharma talks or you know, when you're at work or interacting with your friends, uh, the relative part of life is front and center. Um, even in the Buddhist teachings, it seems like the relative part of life, like the psychological self-soothing, how we can all feel better in our bodies, in our communities. Uh, but there's something so much deeper that is the, the river that we all come from. And that, that river is very alive in any moment that we choose to see it. Um, so anyone who speaks of that, it, it seems like a very powerful movement. It's also where liberation is. Um, we, you can't be free unless you're in that river and you're understanding that. Um, and it seems like gender, male, female, that, that doesn't exist in the river, or it, it exists, but we're all that. No, you know, I can't say that I am a male. It just doesn't feel right, and I think that's what you were alluding to with right view. You know, the right view is that space that we all are. So it, it felt really nice to hear you say that. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, it's always a little bit of a risk, because I never know if I'm going to totally lose people with that one. But <laughs> I think... I think a lot of people are afraid of it when, whenever yes. people bring it up. That yes. People don't want to talk about that, so I yeah. appreciate it. I like your river description. That's great. Yeah. Thank you. Another thing I think is um, really helpful and important to think about is in relationship, when we're in relationships, we can't, uh, humans need relationships. They need attachment. We can't be healthy without it. And that is at the relative level. We need to be able to bond with one another. And we know that whenever there's attachment, there is the, the certainty that we are going to be separated at some point. 
the more that we can bring in our relationships, we have to negotiate our contracts. We negotiate how we're going to relate to one another, all the way from a marriage contract to a friendship. Um, we have agreements about how we're going to relate to one another. Those are all relative. They have to be by their very nature. But the more we can bring an understanding of absolute love to those relationships, the more we can relate to that part, that absolute part of one another, the more, the less suffering there is, the less fear. Those are the parts that can't be separated from one another. So we have to live on the relative level, but as Christine said, when you bring the understanding and the awareness that we're all uh, integral, that we're all tied to one another, um, and that the, the separation is um, only on this level, the happier we can actually be in our relationships. One more question. Yeah. Is not enlightenment living on the absolute level? Like you're saying that we have to be on the relative level, but I disagree. I feel like you can release the relative to be what it has been conditioned to be. You can't stop it, you can't change it, but your perspective can be the, the right view, which is absolute. It's not engaging in the relative? Theoretically, yeah. <laughs> I think, you know, it's, um, I'm not there yet. I think that I like the idea and it certainly is consistent with what the Buddha taught. So far, my inclination is to give, um, to deeply honor this human uh, manifestation of the absolute. So not seeing it as separate really, but as, as the, the way that the universe has produced us in this moment in time is quite beautiful and unique and relative. So I don't really separate them uh, and I'm more comfortable with that than the idea that somehow I'm going to go beyond this body or beyond the needs of this human existence. Are we getting too far out there for you guys? <laughs> I, I, would, I would say um, that yes, I, I think you're, you're, the statement you made is, is accurate, that the more that we are able to live in that absolute place, we will get to be more and more living in it, right? And it's not that we're not still interacting out in the world, um, but the interacting out in the world is um, there's so much less identification with all that's happening out there in the world. It's just not, we're not seeing it as the thing we once saw it as. We're not, we're, we're not as deeply, we're not in it, right? So yes, I think it can be, right. I think one can live from that place completely and that is what enlightenment is. Mm -hmm. It's living from the absolute. By the way, I did want to mention, if this thing about absolute reality is just completely confounding to people, uh, it was completely confounding to me. It took me a really long time. And so don't feel like, like, oh no, I don't know what this is. The mind can't really grasp what this is. We're using a lot of words to try to sort this out. And by us using words, we're already not in it, <laughs> right? Ah, this thing's frustrating. <laughs> You think it's me, yeah, okay. Yes, it's the laughing. Just to follow up on that, uh, I have to quote Yogi Berra. <laughs> and he said, in theory, there's no difference between practice and theory. In practice, there is. <laughs> think about that. I'm interested in what you were saying about uh, situations that elicit strong reactions or weak reactions and that strong reactions often indicate an inner story and that's, uh, that part of your talk kind of soothed me with 
how good it sounded, and they realized, I don't really know what you mean. And it would help to have some.